Dr. Saladino, when you're recommending this diet, what risks do you discuss with your patients? I don't think there are any risks to eating animal foods exclusively. There are no risks in terms of kidney function. Mm -hmm. There are many studies which show that high protein diets do not affect kidney function. Mm -hmm. There are no studies interventionally that show that eating meat is going to increase the risk of any single cancer. So after watching the Carnivore MD, Dr. Paul Saladino and the Doctor Show last year, I uploaded uh, an excerpt of the same show where a couple of highly esteemed doctors completely schooled his diet nonsense. I don't know what research you're reading, but there are literally thousands of studies showing the benefits of polyphenols. Let's start with those, for example, plant-based nutrients in the diet. The National Institutes of Health just gave the Cleveland Clinic $12 million of our taxpayer money to study the impact of meat on TMAO and the microbiome because there are 1,000 studies that are indicating harm. And I am a world expert on TMAO, Dr. Selby. Don't take me on this. You will not be happy. I will not be kind. Wait 10, 20 years before you play with this dangerous diet. So that was just an excerpt of a video that we edited together. And uh, I believe we uploaded it to YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. And Dr. Paul Saladino clearly saw this video. He didn't like it. And then started messaging us privately, uh, including sending this voice note, which you're about to hear. That's weak sauce and you know it. I got school. If any of these doctors ever came on my podcast, I would show you what's up. If any plant-based doctor ever came on my podcast, they're all afraid. You'll see what's up. Wow, he actually sent that to us on Instagram. I don't know if you heard that, but I think we should play it again. That's weak sauce and you know it. I got school. If any of these doctors ever came on my podcast, I would show you what's up. If any plant-based doctor ever came on my podcast, they're all afraid. You'll see what's up. Anyway, Dr. Paul Saladino has been all over YouTube in the last few months and I was going to do a video questioning some of his carnivore diet claims, but then I saw a video by my friend Chris, whose channel I'll link down below, who did an excellent job of debunking some of his diet philosophy nonsense. Hope you enjoy the video. Several friends asked me about the carnivore diet episode on Joe Rogan's podcast that featured Paul Saladino. Here's the thing. Paul looks like he could be Will Bolsowitz's brother. Both are good-looking 40-something doctors with great physiques who publish best-selling books with completely opposing messages. Will is all about plant-heavy diets like the Mediterranean or whole plant vegan, whereas Paul is all meat all the time. How's a consumer with no scientific or medical background to figure out who got it right? Both are great guys who believe they're on missions to improve the world. But their messages are so opposite, there's no room for both to be right. Or is the answer no one knows, so just eat to feel good? Paul got 10 times the views on YouTube in his interview with Joe Rogan than Will did in his interview with Rich Roll. But I think I can show very simply without confusing biochemistry that Will has 10x the credible science on his side. Bold claim, let's go. Joe and Paul opened with this idea. As a talking point that I actually stole from you is that most plants are inedible, but almost all animals are edible. That's true, and not just for humans, but for any plant-eating animal like a cow, a horse, or a monkey. Does that mean they're better off eating meat? That experiment has been done carefully and published perhaps a thousand times on various animals like rabbits and pigeons and monkeys and pigs, you name it. It doesn't take much for their arteries to close up like it did with these monkeys, which became totally blocked when 40% of their calories in this case came from egg yolks. Once they went back to eating predominantly plants, their arteries opened back up like this. That only works for herbivores and omnivores. You can't give a lion heart disease with meat. But guess whose arteries clog up if you give them a fair amount of meat? Humans! Clogged arteries are the leading cause of death in America. And now we know from doing MRI scans on prehistoric humans, those that ate much meat got it too. Here's Otzi the Iceman from 5,300 years ago who had wild ibex meat in his stomach and had very advanced heart disease. Same with Inuits who lived 500 years ago in Greenland. I remember there was a story about uh, a guy in a nursing home and uh, he had went out and picked mushrooms for the people in the nursing home and cooked them up and they all died. Are we really gonna focus on death by mushroom in the middle of a pandemic that's killed a million and a half people so far? It's not the plants that send out viruses to get us, it's the animals we raise to eat. The overwhelming incidence of food poisoning that emergency room doctors see comes from bacteria like salmonella, which originates in animals. So I think that's minus five science points for Paul and Joe for insane logic with no data. The premise of the carnivore code is returning to our ancestral diet. 
It's on the cover of the book, and the early part of the book is devoted to it. Quite fascinating. Here's the thing. People who devote their lives to studying the evolution of men say the idea of a paleo diet is a myth. People ate completely different diets depending on where they live, just as modern humans do today. For example, Aborigines in Australia love grubs. Does that make them good for us? Maybe pick up a bag at Amazon and see if your blood work improves. They make a unique snack around the office to impress your coworkers. Aborigines, like most ancient humans, dug up a lot of fibrous roots to eat. The digging stick has been used by Australian Aborigines for thousands of years. It was of particular importance to Aboriginal women, as it was their primary means of digging up roots and tubers, which was the mainstay of their diet. What separates the carnivore diet from every meat-heavy diet before it is Paul's belief that any amount of plants is toxic to humans. I'm trying to show respect, but let me read you a passage from his book and let you judge for yourself. As an aside, the whole premise that molecules that independently evolved in plants would somehow be beneficial on humans sounds a bit far-fetched to me. It would be highly unlikely for one molecule, let alone thousands of molecules, produced during plant evolution to truly be beneficial on humans after our evolutionary path diverged from theirs 1.5 billion years ago when we were little more than a single-celled blob. Imagine the odds against this! Exclamation point. Ugh, I'm sorry for facepalming, but he really wrote that. Honestly, I think most high school biology teachers would give minus 10 science points for that, because co-evolution of plants and animals is key to the world's ecosystems. Charles Darwin wrote about that in 1859 in Origin of Species. This is why I recommend listening to actual evolutionary biologists, not Paul. I'm an archaeological scientist, and I study the health and dietary histories of ancient peoples using bone biochemistry and ancient DNA. So people who live in places where there are no plants tend to eat more animals, and people who live in places where there are plants tend to eat more plants. The big question is, does it matter? We don't eat grubs and lizards anymore. We eat what we forage in Safeway. Isn't the most important thing which modern foods make modern humans with modern lifestyles slim, vibrant, and healthy? Trying to figure that out from ancient fossil records is like extreme CSI. But now we have all the things, blood tests, MRI scans, and death records. And that brings up epidemiology, a field of science most of us revere when it comes to infectious diseases like COVID-19 and tracing its spread. Epidemiology is what helped us unravel the health effects of smoking. This is where Will has a huge advantage because he got a master's degree in epidemiology on his way to med school and has co-authored 21 scientific papers, plus 10 science points for Will. If you trust epidemiology, which Joe and Paul don't and Will does, then you believe the world's healthiest people eat plant-dominated diets. So why would epidemiology be so trusted by consumers in infectious disease, but not by the same consumers in nutrition? Oh, I know the answer to that one because I lived it in earth science. In 1988, when acclaimed astrophysicist James Hansen, head of NASA's Institute for Space Studies, testified before Congress about global warming. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Dr. Hansen, if you'd start us off, we'd appreciate it. And then George H.W. Bush embraced it. Those who think we're powerless to do anything about this greenhouse effect are forgetting about the White House effect. Scientists thought, at long last, the science has become so clear and obvious, this would become like science's increasing progress against smoking. We knew the coal and oil companies were coming for us, like the tobacco companies were doing, but we had no idea they could successfully shake the faith in science of so many Americans and disrupt the careers of great scientists. I've been arrested, I think, four times. 32 years later, it looks like Dr. Hansen's models were incredibly accurate and science will end up on the right side of history as it usually does, hopefully not tragically late. Back to food, since all credible epidemiology points to plant-dominant diets being the best for health and long-term weight loss, the only thing for the beef, dairy, and egg councils to do was to discredit the science. They're the masters of it. They were judged, convicted. Bad rap, huh? and put away for a long, long time. But now, new evidence shows it was a bad one. Eggs contain 22% less cholesterol than previously thought. All right, let the eggs go! Which is why the American Heart Association has increased its weekly egg yolk allowance for healthy people from three to four. California Fresh Eggs, give them a break. Why do I mention epidemiology? 
because it's long term. Even if you smoke, it probably takes 20 years to have major impact. Paul has been on the carnivore diet for two years. He came to it as a psychiatrist who listened to the Joe Rogan interview with Jordan Peterson, a psychologist. How many times have clinical trials indicated the short-term safety of things like artificial sweeteners, only to find out 20 years later they weren't safe at all? But blood tests are a good short-term snapshot of health. So a great question is, what are the blood tests of carnivores? What's Paul's? What would happen if you went to a cardiologist? They would fall out of their chair when they saw my lipids. They would say How that- How bad is it? My most recent LDL was very high. It was 533 milligrams per deciliter. I went to the Mayo Clinic's heart attack risk calculator and tried to input Paul's numbers. It's based on an enormous database we have accumulated in America of risk factors. It even asks how many servings of fruit and vegetables you eat because the data shows that reduces risk and how many servings of meat because the data shows that increases it. It also wants to know your blood pressure, weight, how much you exercise, and whether you've ever smoked. But Paul's number blew up the calculator because it wouldn't take total cholesterol higher than 350, and his is nearly twice that. So I looked for other carnivore blood tests. Here's a 28-day challenge where Joe, a nine-month high meat eater, went vegan for 28 days, and Chase, a 10-year vegan, went high meat for 28. Four doctors who are on various diets themselves commented on the blood work where the key numbers went like this. LDL cholesterol in the vegan more than doubled to the high risk category and the high meat eaters dropped in half to the low risk category. Insulin dropped while eating vegan and increased while eating carnivore. IGF-1, which is linked to a risk of cancer, dropped while eating vegan and increased while eating carnivore. C-reactive protein, which is a measure of inflammation, dropped dramatically when the carnivore went to vegan, although that number bounces around a little bit. It's high after you run a half marathon, for example. I'll put links in the description to the pretty informative and entertaining live stream where Joe and Chase get revealed their blood tests in real time. It was far from a well-controlled scientific test, but the only person it seemed to really surprise was the carnivore doctor who said these guys must not be eating nose to tail. Too many muscle meats, not enough organ meats. They didn't identify who the doctor was who made those comments, but it sure sounded like Paul. The Joe Rogan Paul Saladino episode got millions of views, although I think it's unlikely that any came from doctors or scientists. The guys who switched diets got a few hundred thousand views across several YouTube channels, and it was interesting because data. But we do have massive data carefully collected by real scientists. Most people have vaguely heard of the Framingham study, where we have a million blood samples collected over 70 years and rooms full of medical records from 15,000 participants. Almost every part of the body that could be imaged, measured, or tested, Framingham has done that. It doesn't get the YouTube views, but it's massively respected among cardiologists and scientists, and the conclusions are ever so clear. High blood pressure, smoking, high cholesterol, when Joe asked Paul about his high numbers, Paul went into science denial mode using word salad with technical terms, which seemed to really impress Joe. And then you start to look at people outside the norm like yourself, and you go, okay, this guy has spent so much time thinking about this stuff, maybe he's got some insight that other people have not acquired. Actually, Paul's only been thinking about it for a few years and hasn't been involved in any scientific studies. But thankfully, we have national treasures like Jeremiah Stamler, who's still massively respected at age 100 and still actively doing heart disease research funded by the NIH after doing 800 publications. Dr. Stamler helped scare the beef industry into major science denial mode way back in 1969 with comments like this. I would underline the fact that the distribution of serum cholesterol in the population, the mean levels, the rates of hypercholesterolemia, differ markedly among these countries, and along with that, the coronary rates differ, and only diet can explain these differences. How about this 80-something Olympic gold medalist in rowing, Bronze Star surgeon from Vietnam, distinguished scientist and surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, who fixed Bill Clinton's heart disease and weight problems without surgery. Here's how you explain things without technical word salad. Coronary artery disease is the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization. And yet the truth be known, it is nothing more than a toothless paper tiger that need never exist. And if it does exist, it need never ever progress. This is a foodborne illness. But Chris, how about just eating till you feel good? Isn't that the ultimate in common sense? Paul and Joe mentioned that a lot. This is where I have to give plus 10 science points to Will, 
who makes his living looking inside you with a colonoscope. How many people do we know who looked and felt fantastic just before getting a heart attack, ulcerative colitis, or colon cancer? For example, in a, in a patient just this past week, I had a, a patient who was, he was 50, and I found a huge polyp. So his colonoscopy saved his life, because if he never had a colonoscopy, he would have had colon cancer. And what does he say about risk factors for colon cancer? Every 10 grams of fiber that you consume gives you 8 to 10% reduced risk of developing colorectal cancer. That doesn't mean, unfortunately, that you can eat 100 grams of fiber and, and reduce your risk to zero. But what it does mean is that a high fiber diet is to our benefit. And here we are in the United States, and the average person is only getting 15 grams of fiber per day, which is minuscule. It's nothing. Finally, I know some of you wonder about the planet, and Paul is well known for headlines like this. You know, as someone who has spent 16 years as an Earth scientist, I feel pretty confident in saying, I think this spry 93-year-old is a better authority to listen to. Whenever we choose a piece of meat, we too are unwittingly demanding a huge expanse of space. The planet can't support billions of large meat eaters. <sighs> that was a really hard episode for me. So much science denial on topics that matter so much, it's hard on the soul. But the good news is the science is really clear that eating a plant-predominant diet is the best thing we could do for our health and the planet. I hope this was helpful, and thanks so much for watching.